Hello friends, welcome. My name is Lisa Graustein. I'm a member of Beacon Hill Meeting in Boston. And this is the second video in a series of three looking at our minute on climate change as part of a larger video series I'm doing around a virtual plenary this year for us. So in the last video, we looked at our several minutes over the last three years on climate change. And in this video, we're gonna look at patterns of diversity. Um, and this is a term that I learned from Neonu Span. And patterns of diversity are the behaviors and ways of being that work to maintain systems of oppression. They are taught implicitly and explicitly from childhood. So there's something that all of us learn and are acculturated to if we grow up in this country. And it's how society expects us to navigate difference and power when they're present. And the, the great thing about being able to recognize patterns of diversity is that once we can identify them, we can interrupt them and we can change them. Until we can see them, they're pretty static and we're kind of caught up in them. But once we can see them, we can then act differently and interrupt them and work to change the dynamics. And so this video is going to look at what are some of the patterns of diversity, patterns of oppression, patterns of faithfulness that we can recognize in our relationship to the earth um, through the minutes that we have approved around climate change. And before I look at the specific patterns, I want to look at their origins. And I'm going to go back to Genesis because Genesis 1 is where humans' relationship to the earth first gets established. And so in Genesis 1:26, part of the creation story, then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So, right, there's two stories in Genesis. This is the first one. And God is giving us people dominion over the earth and the way that both the Hebrew word is interpreted and the way that the word gets interpreted um, later on in Christianity is is control rule over domination of and that word dominion I've highlighted because it's also the word that the Pope uses in the doctrine of discovery um, giving license to Christians to completely conquer subdue control have um, supreme authority over not just the land of the Western Hemisphere, but all the natural resources in the people. And so like that, that relationship of us getting to control over goes very, very far back. The second creation story, the relationship is different. So in Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And so the verbs that are used are very different and the relationship that's established is very different. Here we are meant to till and to keep, to be in relationship with, to live in harmony with, to care for, to tend. And any of us who are gardeners know that when we exploit our soil, when we don't care for our plants, the garden does not sustain us. It does not do as well. And so this notion of tilling and keeping is about being in right relationship with the earth, about living in harmony with the earth, about being in a symbiotic relationship in which our livelihood and sustainability is in direct relationship to how we treat the earth and nurture the land upon which we're living and the ways that we tend to the plants and animals that are there. And so these two tensions of our relationship to the earth go back to our own origin stories as a Christian faith and denomination that we have this relationship of domination and control, which gets set down through the doctrine of discovery and through the formation of um, colonization and what will become and now is the United States. And as friends who seek to live in right relationship, we have also sought over time to live in the spirit of that second creation story where our relationship to the earth is about tilling and keeping and having care for. And so patterns from both of those pieces are going to show up in how friends have lived on this hemisphere and in how today we understand our relationship to the earth, to creation, and to climate change. I also want to connect the Doctrine of Discovery, White Supremacy, and Climate Change. As in the previous video in this um, series, I invited us to think about how our minutes on the Doctrine of Discovery, Climate Change, and White Supremacy are interlocking. I now want to look at how the patterns of diversity, patterns of oppression that come from um, the Doctrine of Discovery, that come from white supremacy, that come from our relationship to the earth are also interlocked. So the patterns of diversity or patterns of oppression that we looked at in the Doctrine of Discovery were ones of separation, 
domination and control, and exploitation. And if we think about how we, the majority of us in New England Yearly Meeting, have been living in relationship to the earth, it's often about seeing some separation of ourselves from the earth. That is very much in the ethos of the United States mainstream culture, right? The earth is this thing you have to control and subdue. Um, and so even though our Quakerism calls us to be in different relationship, I know I personally often inhabit that space. And it's also separation from the impact that particularly for those of us who have um, material, race, and other forms of societal privilege, I'm pretty well buttressed so far from the impact of climate change. I can keep myself separate from it. I can purchase my way out of it. I can move from my coastal city if and when I choose to, to another space. Um, and so there's still some separation both from the earth and from the impact of climate change. Right, around domination and control, our relationship of dominating and controlling the natural world. I burn fossil fuels in my house. I'm connected to the infrastructure of my city and of our nation. There is a way that I seek to dominate and control the natural world for my own comfort and ease of living, right? And exploitation is an extension of that. The way that collectively our nation has exploited the resources of our land. We have exploited animals in different ways and we have exploited people in different ways and that all of those are connected. When we talked about the patterns that came out of white supremacy, we talked about othering, misuse of silence, denial, and shame. And so when we think about how those patterns show up in our relationship to the earth and climate change is that for a long time, because most friends have been um, buffered from the impacts of climate change, we have done some othering around who has been impacted, right? And initially when we talked about this, we said those who have the least impact will likely experience um, the greatest harm without understanding that the people who often have the least impact on climate change have been experiencing the greatest harm. And so there's been an othering and some more separation there. Around our misuse of silence, we've been quiet for too long on this issue, though many of us understand as part of our Quaker faith, we need to live a less impactful lifestyle. I know for me, I have not stepped into really owning my impact on the earth, the size of my environmental footprint, that um, I have been quiet for too long about this that there's still denial, denial of the urgency and denial of our part. So while our most recent minute that we approved last summer names the urgency and actually calls for measured action that we're gonna take, I think there's still a level of denial. And my father, who is a geochemist, was very active in the 80s with the American Geophysical Union of actually talking about education. And so I grew up in a house where literally the science and data of global warming in the early 80s was like spread out across my living room and dining room on a weekly basis. And I still live as if I don't know that truth. I don't know that data. I didn't grow up with that reality in terms of the lifestyle choices that I make. And so ways that our denial is still present um, and the level at which we need to work through that to really step up to the urgency of our times now. And then there's shame. So when we talked about white supremacy, we talked about ways that white supremacy can create shame in people around our identities and around how we show up. And for me, when I think about shame and climate change, because I do heat with oil, I do drive a car, I do live with all the infrastructure, um, I definitely do feel a sense of shame. And sometimes that shame is paralyzing. And that leads to an additional pattern I wanna look at of how fear, resistance, and grief can show up and work together. That I think a lot of us experience a sense of fear of what we might have to give up if we were truly to do our part in interrupting climate change, um, or fear around it's, it's too late, we have not done enough, and we have passed the tipping point, and we can't stop this. And I think that fear is very real, and it's a fear we don't often talk about. And for me, when I feel a lot of fear, that's a pretty paralyzing space. I can't do a lot of creative movement from that space. And the other piece I think is around grief, that for those of us who are fairly disconnected from the natural world, 
where we actually hold some unacknowledged grief around what we have lost in terms of our relationship to the natural world and also grief around what we perceive we are going to lose that when i really sit with the data when i really sit with the predictions when i really sit with the images of hundreds of thousands of people being displaced or killed by climate change i feel some grief about that and it's not grief i want to feel and so for me and i think for some other friends when we feel grief when we feel fear that can lead to a resistance of not wanting to act because we don't want to feel those feelings. And that's a very natural human reaction, but it's one that we need to begin to work through at a greater rate because of the urgency of now. And so I want to look at now, how do we interrupt these patterns and how do we do some of the healing work that's required? And so one model of social change that has been used um, throughout the 20th century in many movements and that many of you will recognize from Paolo Ferreri and other um, activists that we really revere and hold up is a cyclical pattern of where we notice something, we pay attention to something, we actually do the work to unpack it, we feel the feelings around it, we try out new behaviors, we reflect from those new behaviors and move back to what did we notice. And so Earth Care Ministries in its um, ask of us to reduce our carbon footprint by 10% and providing the carbon calculator allows us to notice where we are, unpack the behaviors and lifestyle choices that have us where we are, the calculator doesn't have a place for feelings, but I invite us to actually feel as we use that calculator. The calculator provides not just steps for what we might do, but actually gives us a series of graphs when we fill it out for how our footprint will change based on the commitments we can make for change. And that allows us to reflect and keep moving. And so this is a process that we have a yearly meeting have already committed to around climate change. And I hope around some of these other issues that we have taken on. And the great thing that we have as friends is that we're not doing this alone. And this is not just a social exercise, but that our fears, our insecurities, our resistance, our, um, our feelings of being overwhelmed, we get to release to God that we are not alone in this, that we are held by the divine, that spirit is there to support us. And that when we can release social control and the ways that society influences us to God, we are giving something greater. And that most of the stories we hold up, both the biblical stories and stories of our Quaker ancestors, we don't hold up the people who were cautious and careful and plotting and sort of did what was expected. We hold up those people who were prophets. We hold up those people who stepped out of society's norms and said, this is not the way God is calling us to be. And while many of those people, both biblically and early friends, met with harsh realities, at, even at the moments of their death, we don't hear regret. Mary Dyer did not regret her choices. She was living fully in that faith. And the great thing here is that if we step fully into this, we actually stop the world from becoming an environment where we can't live and create an environment where we all get to live. And so the opportunity here to step fully into our faith and to do this work together is so tremendous. And there is so much power and force for us to actually make changes in climate change, in right relationship with native peoples, in relationship with all the peoples of humanity. And so as we look at these patterns, we have to look at what we do to interrupt them. And often it's just doing something that's in the opposite energy. So where we have experienced separation, where we have separated ourselves, we need to seek to rebuild those connections and to do so respectfully and humbly. Where we have been exerting patterns of domination and control, we need to practice caring for and being with. Where we have been in denial, we need to do truth telling. And each of the minutes that I'm looking at in these visual, virtual plenaries is about truth telling. It's about breaking the denial that we as a yearly meeting have been living in and speaking greater truth out loud to ourselves and to the rest of the world. Where we feel fear and grief, we have to feel it. The only way through those feelings is to fully feel them. And that all that energy that I, and I suspect many other friends do in resisting Fearing, feeling fear and grief is actually energy that I'm not spending um, making the beloved community and living in health and wellness with other people. But that when I allow myself to fully feel those feelings and feel the fullness of them, they shift for me. I don't carry them so heavily and I'm not putting all that energy into repressing them. 
and that where we are experiencing resistance individually, we step into collective action. That when I am resisting something because I am overwhelmed or scared is when I need to reach out and say, friends, help me, pull me along with you until I can move through that resistance. That resistance is bound energy. And so even if I can't move my own resistance, if I can start moving other pieces of me, other ways, it automatically starts to loosen up that resistance and where we need to more fully step into asking each other for help and support in those moments. So as always, I wanna leave you with a full ref few reflection questions. The first one I always ask is as you listen to this, what did you notice in your body? How are you feeling right now, physically, emotionally, energetically? What came up for you? Two, how do you experience or understand the interconnectedness of our commitments to racial and climate justice? Three, where do you find life in living into right relationship? And where or how does resistance show up in you or for you? Thank you, friends. <laughs>